Welcome to the Revolution Church Podcast. Before we begin, we'd like to remind you that our ministry is supported 100% by listeners like you. To make your 100% tax-deductible donation today, please visit revolutionchurch.com slash donate. You can also learn more by clicking the donate section on the website. Hello, welcome to Revolution. As always, I am your pastor and host, Jay Baker. Um, thanks for joining me. Um, happy Sunday, or whatever day you're listening to this. Um, I feel like I should say, this is the day the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. Have you ever been to a church where they say that every Sunday? Um, anyway, I don't know why I said that, but I always thought it was kind of funny. Um, last week we had, well, we're in Galatians again and again, um, in part two, uh, last week we talked about Paul and kind of the person, uh, he was and how he was a violent person, uh, very uh, zealot, uh, very zealous and, um, what the reality of that was. And I just asked you guys to take a reflect, uh, to reflect on, on that type of personality. And probably one of the reasons a lot of people have a hard time with Paul in the Bible. You know, I remember talking to somebody in my seminary class, uh, not this last one, but one before, and they said that they don't read any Paul and that they want Paul to be taken completely out of the Bible. And I think that would be a huge shame. Um, there's books I don't like in the Bible. There's some Paul books that, you know, the pastoral epistles I wouldn't mind having being taken out of the Bible. Um, but at the same point, it's, uh, you know, I found so much grace and, and hope in the writings of Paul that it would be a shame to see that go. But I can see why Paul rubs people the wrong way. Um, I can also see why pseudo Paul or fake Paul, as I like to call him, really rubs people the wrong way. Um, because we're dealing with a very uh, passionate, complex human being who has come from a very different past and now has changed his life to follow this man Christ, almost as like he is a madman. And this message of grace has transformed him greatly. And uh, we're going to take a better look into that today. If you uh, are following along, we're in Galatians 2, and uh, it says, Then after 14 years, now this is one thing I need to point out. As I said, this may have been 10 years uh, after Christ's life. So obviously it was at least 14 to 15 to 16 to 17 to 20 years after Christ's life. Just by saying, then after 14 years, I went again to Jerusalem. So we're probably talking 25 years. Who knows? But I figured that I point that error out and uh, share that with you. So then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up in response to a revelation that I laid before them, though only in pri private meetings with the acknowledged leaders. The gospel that I proclaimed amongst the Gentiles in order to make sure that I was not running or had run in vain. But even Titus, now see, Paul's going up to say, you know, I'm reaching the Gentiles. This new message is something that I have, and I want to see where you guys are with this. I have a feeling had they said, no, don't do it, he would have done it anyway. Um, it's the feeling I, I get from Paul, that he was quite stubborn and uh, very assured in his calling, uh, more than most people, uh, probably a lot more than myself. Um, I think we've got a very type A guy here so he goes up and he's like you know i met privately with leaders and all this stuff and and you think oh he must be getting into this what's what we're going to hear what, what it's like on the inside but that's not what we hear at all i was running or i had run in vain he says but three but titus who was with me was not compelled to be circumcised though he was a greek but because of false believers secretly brought in who slipped in to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus so they might enslave us, we did not submit to them for even a moment so that the truth of the gospel might always remain with you. 
and for those who were supposed to acknowledge leaders, for those who were supposed to be acknowledged leaders, what they actually were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those leaders contributed nothing to me. Whoa, a lot of, a lot of strange things right here. Um, this is why the Bible continues to intrigue me. We have spies. Um, people who were playing political games, obviously, with Paul. And they came in and wanted to see if they're circumcised. So go take a look at these guys' penises and tell me what you see. And it's strange because obviously people have been petty for since the beginning of time. I think what most people don't realize is that when when you hear about ministry scandals um, that happen so often and you go, like, oh, that guy got found out, he got busted or whatever, a lot of the times it's other Christians who uh, expose them. Now, it's not that Christians are supposed to be tight-lipped or anything like that, but often it's other ministers who are their competition or things like this. There's often a lot of politics involved in destroying other people's lives and other people's ministries or exposing that they're uh, flawed human beings. Uh, often plays a big part in Christian politics, especially even evangelicalism. I, I, you know, That's what I grew up in. And, you know... So this is what we're seeing right here is the game here in, in Christian politics already, right away. They're already spying on on Paul and, and his 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 traveling companions to see uh, are they doing what we think they should be doing. And obviously it became an issue, or I don't think that Paul would have written about it in this book or in this letter. Uh, this letter is so interesting because I, uh, because of what he does add. Well, I mean, what he kept in, what he does share with us. It's a very transparent, very honest letter that I, I, I wonder if if it would have been, had he known the impact this letter would have had, had it, had it, how, how long it would have lasted if he would have written it differently. Uh, I'm certainly glad he didn't. So we see these, they're being spied on, you know. But I love the Paul, the fact that Paul says, so the truth of the gospel will might always remain with you. He's like, we did not submit to them for even a moment because he knew how important the gospel was, the gospel of grace, the gospel of mercy. And sometimes I wish that sometimes, uh, sometimes, sometimes, sometimes. No, I wish that we would stand up sometimes when people fall or when times when people make mistakes and we would just stand up and go, you know what? These people are human beings. They made a mistake. Let's move on. Because imagine how powerful that is and what an example of grace that is and how that keeps the message of grace because when we have all these issues of people falling who've already caused and raised impossible standards and then they make mistakes and then they fall because they can't live up to the impossible standards. We continue to create this atmosphere in the church or in our faith uh, that there's this type of standard of living and that if you don't add up, then you're done and you're out or, you know, you don't, you don't get to play the game. You, you know, we're going to, you better take your toys and go somewhere else, which to me is quite ironic on a, on a faith based religion, a religion that says that we're saved by grace, not by works. Um, it's about forgiveness and repentance and change and radical change. You know, that change, it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, it doesn't happen by the, the schedule that we wish it would happen, you know, but often that's what the thing is, is we want our, our time tables of when someone should have their life right or when they should be figured things out or when they should be less legalistic in order for them to be accepted. I know I do. Um, what I really liked is where he goes, what they actually were about the leaders makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. And I think that's one of the more important verses in Galatians is for us to remember that God shows no partiality. And I think it's important because I think it's reasons why we should struggle with the verses and the scriptures, why we should not agree with everything that's written in the Bible. Um, because I don't believe that this is a book that is infallible or was just handed down by God and said, here you go. Um, 
I think we have human beings and this is a human thing. Now we're they're 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 witnesses to an experience, they're witnesses to a moment in time, uh, which we desperately need that. But, you know, times change. Relevance changes, uh, as you see in the Bible, uh, just even in this story alone, things are changing to become more inclusive. And uh, so there'll be those times where we have to say, there's no partiality there. These guys weren't special messengers, you know. Anyhow, I'm sure a lot of people disagree with me, and that's okay. But God shows no partiality. I would have never known that growing up because there was always this thing about the man of God, you know. Got to protect the man of God and the anointed. And, you know, there's all this reverence around human beings. And, uh, and you know, it's, it's, it's part of the reason why would they, human beings, they, when they fall, people rejoice so much is because there's a separation that should not exist. There's a partiality that really shouldn't exist because someone said, well, I decided to study all this, you know. Yeah, it's my job to talk about Jesus. It's my job to talk about the Bible. It's my job to, to have, you know, put out questions and things like that, share with you as honest as I can. But uh, I am in no means more important to God because I spend my time reading a book and because I, am, you know, spend my time focused on the faith. And... uh I think most of us know that, but I think it's something that we need to be reminded. Because, you know, I know I sometimes don't feel like I add up, and not even in a Christian sense, just in a human sense, that that I just don't add up to you, that I'm not good enough to be a human being, that I'm not good enough to be part of society sometimes, you know, or, and I need to be better, and, and if I only didn't do this, or if I only had this, uh, you know, I'd be worth something and, and finding my self-worth in, in certain things. And, and and this whole book is about not finding your self-worth in works or in positions, but in knowing that you are accepted, which is really tough and very important. So uh, Paul goes on in his lovely, polite way to say, those leaders contributed nothing to me. On the contrary, when I saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel they uncircumcised with, for the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel for the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter makes him an apostle to circumcised, also worked through me, sending me to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who were acknowledged pillars, recognized the grace that had been given to me, they gave to Barnabas and me the right hand of fellowship, agreeing that we should go to the Gentiles and to the circumcised, and to and they to the circumcised. Lots of circumcision talk here. They asked only thing that we remember is to the poor, which we actually what I was eager to do. So you see importance of the poor. I love that because I love it. It overshines all this political stuff. It's like, you know, remember, we've got to take care of the poor, those who can't help themselves. We must help them. Um, so that vital reminder of who Jesus has called us to is still there. Even if it just slipped in, it's still there that don't forget the poor. Some people are like, well, the poor you'll always have with you. Yes, and that's why we must never forget them. As you do the least of these, you do to the, me, said, the, uh, said Jesus. Um, well, one of the things I noticed here is that when Paul is, is talking about the same person who called Peter to be apostle to the circumcised is also the same works through him to reach the Gentiles. So Paul is making it very clear here to his opponents and to the people of, of Gaul and the, the Galatians that he is a peer with Peter. You know, the guy is not shy about stating where he stands or who he thinks he is, you know, and most of us would say his ministry over, you know, overshadowed Peter's eventually, you know, and probably started what Christianity is today. Uh, and what Christianity became and kept it going. So, of course, because he, he had a, a bigger pool to reach into. 
But interesting that right there he makes it very clear, we are peers. Peter, the rock, Jesus was built his church on. Him, I am the rock, he builds his Gentile church on. We are peers. He doesn't say that, but that's what it seems like he's saying. And uh, so that's... Uh, Paul is, this is a letter of defense, and, and Paul is just not holding back. Uh, he seems very stubborn at this point, and uh, I, I, I like this way this book reads. 11 says, But when Cephas came to Anatoch, I opposed him to his face because he stood self condemned. For until certain people came from James's, He used to eat with the Gentiles, but after they came, he drew back and kept himself separate for fear of the circumcision faction. That sounds like a band. Uh, The circumcision faction. And other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy so that even Barnabas was led astray. Now remember Barnabas where he says they gave earlier Paul and Barnabas the right hand. It's one of his traveling partners, one of his companions that he's traveling and ministering with is Barnabas. And um, so even Barnabas was led astray by by this hypocrisy. But when I saw they were not acting consistently with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, like a, like a, if you, through, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? So he says, you know, you're being a hypocrite. He, one of the important things I think we see here is that he speaks truth to power. He knows that this is an important thing. He knows that this message of grace being completely inclusive rather than something exclusive is so valuable that he has to speak truth to Peter. He has to say, you know, that's who he's, Cephas, he's rebuking Peter. So not only has he just earlier shown us that he's an equal to Peter, now he's going on to say, not only am I saying I'm an equal to Peter, I have actually had to rebuke Peter and put him back into his place and remind him the importance of the inclusive gospel. And this is power. Paul, this is the power that be, is, 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 is Peter. And he speaks truth to power. So when we see people speaking truth to power, I often think of this verse. I often think of what Paul's doing here. And he's not going to let James's folks, he's not going to let the James gang, he's not going to let Paul, he's not going to even let his own friend Barnabas off the hook uh, if they are getting in the way of grace, if they are getting in the way of people knowing that they are included and they are accepted. Um, it makes me wish in high school I would have had Paul in our lunchroom. It seemed that we were all divided by race. Uh, you know, and when you're teenagers, you're, you, life is different and frayed, but, you know, it would have been nice for him to come along and say, what are you guys doing? <laughs> Aren't you all human beings? So maybe you're listening to this and you're in high school. Maybe go sit somewhere next week. Different. But that's what I see. It, was, it seemed like a high school moment. Everybody was kind of afraid of James. Maybe James was equally as a hothead. And so when James's group shows up, they all of a sudden they're afraid to be seating with Gentiles. You know, or maybe it was a leadership thing. You know, and all the leaders thought they would just get together and separate themselves. That happens often as well. And Paul, either way, sees this and rebukes it. He goes on in the rest of two. He goes, we ourselves, this is this is part of his rant. And, is, and you got to remember, this isn't a letter. This isn't a letter written to these folks. So he is sharing clearly all the dirty laundry of the disciples and his fellow apostles. He is being very honest because he feels there's something extremely important here that people see. And that they don't become respecters of particular men, or they don't become followers of Peter, or followers of Paul, or followers of James, but they stay in touch with the truth of the gospel, um, which is, you're saved by grace, not by works. No man may boast. It's a a faith thing. You can't do it through earning works, through holidays, through uh, 
circumcision, what you do or what you don't do. For me growing up, a lot of my faith was based on what you do or what you don't do. And it was easy to seem like you lost your faith if you did the wrong thing. You know, and people say, oh, you're not very Christ-like or, you know, you, you know, you go to church on Sunday, but then the other days you do A, B, and C. You know, it was always this work-based ideal. And uh, because I don't spend as much time in church as I often wonder, and feel free to email or Facebook, text, tweet, whatever. Let me know what you think. But, you know, is the spirit still alive and well in the church? It seems it is in politics, but I, I think it's probably still alive and well in church, and, and we need to continue to speak truth into it. I think the thing that people want to see when they say they'd like to see the church be a safe place, I think people like Paul could have made it that way. I mean, yeah, there's a, a, a bit of hostility there, but, you know, he's like a revolutionary and uh, and focused on a message. And that message is a quality. It really is. That's a big part of his message. And people miss out on that. And I think that's why certain people say, well, I get rid of Paul. I don't like Paul the Apostle. Because they don't see this as a message of equality. They see him as a hothead or someone who excludes uh, LGBTQ people, which I don't believe he does. I believe there's mistranslations. I think there's people not writing, reading the book within its actual context. Um, you know, where he excludes women. And I tell you that I don't believe that that's right either. Um, so, you know, I think we, but we don't look at here and look at where Paul is demanding people sit together, that the message not be taken apart uh, by being exclusive. Let's just finish this up with the rest of two. We ourselves are Jews by birth, not Gentile sinners, which, well, that must have been nice to be called. Yet we know that a person is justified not by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. You know, here goes simple, the message. And we have come to believe in Christ Jesus so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by doing the works of the law because no one will be justified by the works of the law. Um, what is your works of the law? You know, I wonder, we all have it. What is our, what makes us add up? And who are we looking to be justified to? Maybe it's not always God, but maybe it's the church or it's our spouses or our friends or people we work with, or our boss. You know, who, you know, who is it that we're willing, you know, that we're afraid of? That we think that we, you know, we want to be justified. What is our new law? What is our law? For me, legalism for so long in the church was the law of the, the legalistic Christians who set up new laws, who spied on people's freedoms, who told me if I did this or didn't do that, I wasn't acceptable. That was it, you know, for me. And so when I read these books, it was like having, you know, shackles taken off of me and allowing me to have my faith back realizing that, oh, I'm a human being and that's okay and that this gospel was written for human beings. It wasn't written for saints or perfect people or people who are even necessarily able to handle religion or be religious. 17 goes on to say, but if in our effort to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have been found to be sinners in Christ, then are we servants of sin? Certainly not. So we're not servants of sin if we have our sin, you know, struggles in our own lives. With you know, but if we are, if, I'm going to read that again, seventeen. But if in our effort to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have been found to be sinners in Christ, then a servant, but to be sinners in Christ, then a servant of sin certainly not. But this is what he does say. So, of course, all sin, all falls short, standard. No one's perfect. Not even one. But here in 18 it says, But if I build up again the very thing that I once tore down, then I demonstrate that I am a transgressor. And Paul is saying, if I go back to the law, if I go back to earning, if I go back to the do this, don't do that way of living, if I go back to the us and them situation, if I go back to what he just talked about, 
Paul and then Barnabas and James and all them not eating with Gentiles. If I go back to that, then I have become a transgressor. That is the message here. I have transgressed. I have fallen, you know, away from grace only when I fall back into the law. That's what causes my transgression is when I become inclusive or no, not what not inclusive, but exclusive. When I become exclusive, when I become an us and them, when I become somehow better than thou. For though the law I died, the law so for through the law, Paul goes on to say, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. And Paul's being very, very honest and very literal here. Paul died to the law. It was his life. It was his lifeblood. It was where he found his worth. It was his system. It was everything he worked his whole life studying, and he had to die to it. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. I mean, I think about how Paul must have felt to say this, to have spent the majority of his life studying the Quran, studying, not the Quran, I'm sorry, studying the, the law, studying the Bible, studying uh, studying all his religion, his whole faith, and then all of a sudden he goes, oh, it's not about the laws, it's not about the Ten Commandments, it's not about Levitical law, it's not about, you know, it's not about this, it's about grace, it's about loving God with all my heart and my neighbor as myself. It's about sitting with a group of Gentiles even when it's uncomfortable. Pretty heavy stuff. And so when he says he's been crucified to Christ, I really believe that. I believe it's probably taken a lot for him. I know for a lot of us who grew up in conservative Christian values or have grown up in certain ways, we have a hard time shaking those old feelings. And that's why a lot of us just do away with it completely because it's just nasty to even feel them and be in way have, have those legalistic thoughts and those judgmental thoughts that came along with Christianity and, and the exclusion and the pain that it caused so many people that we don't want anything with it. Well, I think Paul's been really here and saying, I've crucified that with Christ. I'm dead to me now. I no longer live. Basically that stuff in me, it no longer lives. It's Christ who lives in me. So I live in grace. Christ, Christ lives in me. I don't live in that old law anymore. I'm not going to live in those old situations. I'm not going to live in that exclusion. And then I live now my life in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Another one of the verses I find important here is when we're ending on right now. It says, I do not nullify the grace of God. For if justification comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. And uh, it doesn't much get much clearer than that. And this is this is what we're looking at. Paul's part of Paul's rebuke to Peter, and what he's rebuking to the people, the Galatians. He's he's saying, you know, this is very clear. If you don't, you nullify grace when you go back to the law. That's where we hear fall from grace and things like that. Uh, it's not when people make mistakes and their lives necessarily fall apart, but it's when people go back to the law. It's when people go back to uh, a system that only works for some and not others. Um, some might say I'm stretching this a little bit, but I don't feel like I am because I feel like that's exactly what's happening here. Is Paul saying, I mean, I've come to reach everybody, you know, Gentiles, all the Gentiles, and this message is important, and I've had to die to Christ in order die with Christ in order to do this. I've had to stand up to the apostles in order to do this. You know, I've had to avoid hypocrisy and stand up to hypocrisy in order to do this. So we nullify grace is when we don't allow others to see grace and we don't share it with them when we show them that we may make them believe that justification comes somehow through something else. So how do we do that? What do we, what is in our own lives that make us, what are the signals that we send out that justification comes through being cool or knowing a certain amount of the Bible or, you know, 
being, uh, I think a lot of times being super liberal because I'm, I'm liberal and I know that sometimes like, well, if you're not liberal and you don't think like me, then, you know, you're excluded and don't dare cross me on Twitter, you know, you know what I'm saying? And when do we nullify the grace of God to others? When we get on our high horse? When do we forget the inclusive, being about being inclusive? Even to those who aren't. We might have to stand up to Peter's. We might have to stand up to James's. And we might have to talk to our buddies Barnabas's and say, hey, what, what gives, you know? But, you know, at the same time, are there people that we're being that too? So, once again, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if it is justification comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. So, there's nothing you can do. Nothing anybody can do. That's pretty good news. And uh, that's where my faith is and has been for a long time. And that simple message is what keeps me attached to my faith so often that in loving my enemies. So, uh, it's definitely been stretched with uh, going back to, going back, going to school and, uh, you know, seminary is definitely stretching me and, and sometimes even confusing me a bit. But the simplicity of this type of message that is an inclusive, loving message uh, brings me back to a good place, even though you've got someone who is like Paul, a revolutionary. I mean, he is, seems like, you know, this revolutionary person human being who is just saying, we're not going to let this happen. I'm going to even revolutionize it to the very top to make sure it doesn't happen. And stands, stands the power stood to against his power of his past. And now he's standing to the powers of his presence to make sure that this is something that does not get undone. And, uh, I think that's good news. And that's why I continue to preach it and talk about it. And I hope, uh, it encourages you to do the same. Thanks a lot, everybody, for listening. Um, Yeah, thanks. Look forward to next week. This is Revolution Church.